Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's all stand. As always, I believe it's good that we lift our hands. Let's ask the Lord to, to bless and anoint the service today. Lord Jesus, we praise you, God. Lord, we give you all praise, Lord Jesus. Bless the service today, Lord Jesus. Touch every saint that's here. Touch every soul, God. Bless them, Lord Jesus. God, we give it to you today. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, 
let's go ahead and lift our praises unto the Lord. Lord, you're worthy, you're worthy. We lift our praises to you, God. We magnify you, Jesus. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, we thank you, Jesus. Alone is worthy to
Let's lift our hands. If you believe something good is on its way, just magnify him today. Give him praise today. We love you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. Well, like a mighty wind blow through this house, open up the heavens. Let's put our hands together. Let's just keep magnifying the Lord for a moment. We magnify you, Jesus. Lord, reign today, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Let your Holy Spirit reign. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a big hand praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many is glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Oh, let's just keep magnifying him today. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Praise the Lord. You know, I, I like to tell them myself. I think the most honest way that you can relate with people is just to tell them yourself. Because I'm not perfect by any means. I'm far from it. So it's easy for me to tell them myself. But years ago, you know, I've been leading services for a long time. And I've been asked, how in the world is somebody as grumpy as you are that can get up and lead a service? You ever wonder that? You ever wonder that, Sister Missy? <laughs> but honest to God, that's what I get asked. How, how can someone as grumpy as you get up and lead service in a Pentecostal church? It just doesn't seem like it goes together. But I learned a long time ago, when you step into an apostolic Pentecostal church, you got to have the mindset, no matter what's going on in your daily walk, no matter what's going on in your daily life, you got to have the mindset that something good is going to happen today. Something good is going to happen today. you got to have that mindset today. Hallelujah. Brother Kevin, how do you know that something good is going to happen? Well, I can tell you this. I don't have a script that tells me what I got to do in this service. I don't follow no script. We normally start off by worshiping, and then it goes from there. We don't know what's going to happen. But I can promise you, if you stand in faithfulness, and you stand in obedience, and you begin to lift your hands and magnify the Lord, there's no way God's not going to honor that, and there's no way that something good is not going to happen in the house of the Lord today. So if you believe something good is going to happen today, just lift your hands and shout with a mighty voice. I say, in a mighty voice today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, do keep that going. Let's keep that going a little bit. Let's worship him. Oh, expectation. I expect something good to happen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Why don't you release it right now? God, I expect something good to happen. I expect a miracle. I expect the healing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. never know what God's going to do. So you got to expect God to do great things. Because that's the kind of God he is. When you expect something, something's going to happen. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good to see everybody in church. Sister Sowers, good to see you made it today. Good to see others. Good to have the Mowers just home from vacation. We missed you. Glad you're back. Amen. 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 We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And as we pray today, Brother Sowers called early this morning and asked that we would pray for him. He told me to tell you, praise the Lord. So on behalf of Brother Sowers, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. And uh, so uh, let's pray for Brother Sowers, Sister Bissell. Let's pray for her. Let's pray for Sister Robin's mother, Libby, uh, that God would touch her. I uh, got the name right. And uh, I think last time I was praying for Lily or somebody, but uh, somebody got blessed. But uh, we were, let's pray for, for her mother. Her mother uh, has received uh, not some good news from the doctor. So let's pray for them. Brother Brent, where's he at today? That's Brother Brent. Brother Ben done something to his knee. Nick has done something to his knee. I don't know if they were mud wrestling or what. Both of, both of them hurt their knees. We need to pray for Sister Massey. Sister Massey needs a miracle from God. She needs a miracle from the Lord. So let's pray for her and ask God to touch Sister Massey today. Let's touch, let's pray for Bill. Uh, Sister Janie's dad, Bill Sennett, lift him up in prayer. Also, the two young men we've been praying for, both in Ripley, they have cancer. Um, 
Nate and James. Let's pray for these two young men, both of them very young and both of them very serious with cancer. So let's pray for them. It's God to touch them. I noticed that Alice and Clarence were not here this morning for Sunday school. And uh, so let's lift them up in prayer and ask the Lord to touch them. Uh, Vicki Nichols, Vicki's always been a friend of this church. Let's pray for her. Good friend is Brother and Sister Pettits. Ask them to pray. There's a lot of names on the prayer list today for, for healing, uh, but the list is absolutely filled with names for salvation. Let's especially lift these families up and ask God to save them. Healing's a wonderful thing, but salvation's even better. And so let's pray and ask God to touch every one of these, that God would get a hold of their heart, and that God would use us to reach them, to minister to them in Jesus' name. If you've got an unspoken need today, slip your hand up. Amen. Sister Charlotte, good to see you. We want to pray for Sister Charlotte. Ask God to touch her. Sister Charlotte's having to see the doctor and some other issues, so let's pray that God touch her uh, in Jesus' name. And let's pray for this service. I feel the Lord in this place. Let's, let's pray for this service that God will touch and God will move today in Jesus' name. Let's pray. God, in your holy name, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Ghost as we've come into the house of the Lord today. How we believe you, God, as we've stepped into this sanct holy sanctuary, that, God, you are in this house, and where you are, anything is possible. pray in your mighty name, every hand that was raised, every hand that was raised today, we pray that you would minister and touch by your power. Whatever that need may represent, God, you're able, Lord, for there's nothing too hard for you. So, Lord, we believe it and we cast it before you, and we believe something good is going to happen in the name of Jesus. We pray for those. <coughs> we pray for those that are sick. Lord, that you would touch them, Brother Sour, Sister Pistol, Sister Duncan, Sister Massey, God, Brother Bill, Lord, that you would touch and minister to them, Nikki and others, God, on the prayer list, Clarence and Alice, we pray healing in their bodies. God, that you minister to each one of them, whatever needs, God, but most of all, we pray for the lost, save the lost, oh, cause such conviction deal with their hearts such a drawing in the Holy Ghost. God, let us be the vessels that you use to win the lost. Order this service in the Holy Ghost. Anoint Brother Dame today, God, to bring the word and minister to this church. We pray it all in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ
cloth for Sister Massey, and also a prayer cloth over for Michael, and ask God to touch them. Would you reach your hands up here right now, Brother Dave? In the name Hallelujah. of Jesus, right now. God, by the power of your name.
Brother Jonathan, would you take these prayer requests? Pray over them. Thank you, Brother Carl. Taking them back in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Praise the Lord. Aren't you thankful that he'll do it again? And again? And again? And again? And again? How many's a repeat offender in here? Amen. You ever have somebody call you up and you're like, what in the world do they want again? I just talked to them yesterday. What do they want now? But I'm thankful that I serve a God that's not like that. Amen. That he wants me to serve him and he wants me to praise him. He wants me to ask him for to cover all my needs. Amen. Praise the Lord, we're going to have the ushers come as we lift our tithes and our offering. How many is thankful for this part of the service to where we can give our tithes and our offering to the Lord? Amen. you all please stand? Let's sing this song. I can't stand it. For me when I'm gone. For I won't have, have to leave here alone. And when I and hear when that I natural, 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 natural sound, sound, you know my feet will stay on the ground. I'm gonna rise, I'm gonna shout, I'm gonna fly. I'm gonna rise with my Lord in the sky. Just keep loving the Lord and praising Him today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your promises, Lord God. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I'm sorry. There's just some some of these old time classics. I, I can't I can't bear it. We don't, we have to stand. We have to sing them, Brother Johnson. It just doesn't seem right just to be sitting there and clapping along with them. Amen. Hallelujah. You glad to be in the house of the Lord again today? Hallelujah, Jesus. Brother Johnston. Amen. I don't remember the last time I heard that song. It's been a long time. It is. That song says, I, what's the last line? I can't stay here. Heaven is near and I can't stay here. I can't stay here. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay here. When the Lord, when that trumpet sounds, I am out of here. 
I'm gone. Hallelujah. Before we go any farther, in just a little bit, we'll bring Brother Dane to the pulpit. But before we go any farther, I want, we have a tremendous testimony, Sister Janie. God has done such a mighty work uh, in her life. And I want her to share her testimony with you today. Uh, this is what God does. This is what we should expect God to do. So, Sister Janie, I want you to come and share your testimony with the church.
Amen. And uh, I don't see what Janie, is it still off? Okay. Mute it. Brother Robert Dane, missionary, his family, Sister Dane and Pamela. They, they were here in 2010. Uh, it's been, what, that would be 11 years ago that they were here. But they've had a new addition to the family since they were here, and that's Pamela. Pamela's brand new to the family, and so brand new to our church. So let's welcome Pamela. Glad Pamela's here. They have been here, been 10 years ago. We're glad that they're back. I want them to share with you what God is doing in the nation of Bolivia. And God is working here, but God's not just working here. God is working around the world. Every day, all the time, God is at work. You may not see it. And that's why I love missionary services, because they bring it home. They remind us that God is working around the world. So would you stand this morning as we bring to you Brother Dane. God bless you, Brother Dane. Welcome to Ravenswood. God bless you. Hallelujah. Has he been a way maker for you? Has he been a miracle worker? Has he kept his promises? His promises are yea and amen. Hallelujah. They're not yes, no, or maybe. Hallelujah. I'm thankful. Amen. I'm thankful for truth. I mean, you may be seated this morning. I mean, I'm thankful for absolute truth. Truth that can never be relative. And truth will never be canceled. Amen. We're living in the cancel culture. We want to cancel church. We want to cancel... God, the Bible, men want to make truth relative. I'm thankful for absolute truth. Amen. You can trust in it. Amen. And we're thankful, Pastor Johnson, for allowing us to be here again. Amen. I do try to put the T in there. Amen. And, and the D in Sister Adkins. Amen. Learned how to pronounce names here this morning, but... It's a privilege to be back in Ravenswood. We're here May 5th of 2010. And uh, ever since August 2010, all of you have faithfully, amen, committed and, and completed. We thank you for partners and missions. And then every month receiving your offering, we're thankful for that. Can we give a hand clap to all of you? Amen. <laughs> By you, but for you. Amen. For your faithful support. And we're here. Amen. It's almost uh, 12 old coffee. And I don't want to miss that, so um, I'm going to be brief and fast. Amen. But uh, we want to share with you what God has been doing. We've been in Bolivia for 17 years. And uh, if we can tell you in 30 minutes what God did in 17 
years we need to be fired and replaced. Amen. But we will be brief. Amen. And the last time I was here, I was embarrassed at the end of the service. I realized Brother Tony Smith and his son, uh, Steve Smith, his family, grandson here. Amen. They were in service that night after I was all done trying to be a missionary in front of a real missionary. But amen. I hope there aren't any there this evening and this morning. Amen. But it is a blessing to serve God. Amen. We've been there, as I mentioned, 17 years. Before that, we passed at a Spanish church that we started a week after our honeymoon in Louisiana. Amen. I do not advise anyone do that. Uh, but it has been a blessing to serve God no matter where we are. My wife was born and raised in Guatemala. I was born and raised in New Hampshire. Just so you see how God connects and prepares the future. Amen. I w- I'm going to speak in a few minutes about the way maker. And uh, you can see how God makes ways where there isn't a way. Amen. Even when I don't see him or feel him, I know he's working. Amen. Even when he doesn't show up, even when he doesn't make an appearance, he's making a way. And so God is doing things in our lives. We have no idea that he's doing them. And uh, when I was growing up, I I grew up in church, but I had to make a decision one day if I was going to serve God or uh, leave the God that my parents showed me, my grandfather showed me. Amen. Running from God, running from the call to missions. Uh, I realized as a, te- as a teenager that all the missionaries were old, fat, and bald, and I had plenty of time to do what I wanted to do. Uh, and then I could do what God wanted me to do. But I'm thankful. Are you thankful today? You're never too young or too old. Amen. Amen. And it doesn't matter if you're not prepared because no one really is. Amen. But God is looking for a, a vessel that will just say, I will do, I will go. And I'm thankful God gave me a second chance to answer the call because I was on my way to the U.S. Marines and probably Desert Storm in 1991. Thank God for a mom and dad that prayed and a Spanish teacher that said you were born to be a missionary, not military. And at the age of 19, I went to Argentina to help the missionaries on the AIM program. But I learned something real important. You will never dream a dream that compares to God's dream for you. You're not capable of dreaming a dream that's better than God's dream for you. Before you were even in the womb of your mother, God had a dream and a purpose for you. And you will be miserable if you do not follow God's will. Amen. Time is short, so we want to go uh, right into uh, our presentation. Amen. We work primarily with uh, prisons. Uh, we started our church with children and young people that were born and raised in prison. Because in Bolivia, when you go to prison, you have to buy or rent your jail cell. You have to provide your own meals. You even have to provide your own soap, shampoo, toilet paper, whatever. Uh, The government just gives you walls, bars, and policemen to make sure you don't go out when you're not supposed to because some of them do leave and come back. Uh, They do missions for the policemen. Uh, And also the policemen get paid for whatever's not supposed to go in. The last year, uh, (coughs) at three different maximum security prisons, uh, there was a, a live grenade found in each one. Uh, some of the prisoners are armed better than the policemen. And uh, so we have been working extensively. We go in our uh, Move the Mission vehicle now, as it's called. How many here have given to Move the Mission or Seize for Christ? I mean, can we give a hand clap to all of our heroes that support <laughs> providing a vehicle for the missionaries? We can take 22 children to Sunday school in the seven passenger Pathfinder. And we did that for four years. Man, thankfully, we were able to buy a minibus, and, and we can take uh, 30 to 50 children, but we actually send our bus and, and vehicles to the prison, pick up children that live in prison with their mothers. Uh, thankfully, they no longer can live in the men's prison, but they still live in the ladies' prison under the age of six. And so we're able to take them to church and uh, Sunday school and then to lunch and then to the park where they play. Most of their life is behind bars in, in the cement jungle prison. And uh, many of the children will actually eat very little of their lunch and take the rest home to their mothers who have very little to eat. And uh, we also want to thank our ladies' ministries. How many here have given to the ladies' ministry? Can you help me give a hand clap of gratitude from the missionaries to our ladies? Amen. We say thank you. Amen. A washer, dry, and refrigerator are very, very needy and are a great blessing to the work. Uh, and uh, when I was in Argentina on the AIM program, I was 19. I did my laundry with the Bible school students like they did, uh, not with a washing machine, but with a scrub brush and a sink. Uh, 
on a one by four piece of wood. Unless the missionary said, uh, come and cut our, our grass or paint the house or do something. Uh, and they would say, bring your laundry. That was the greatest news of the week. Uh, but we are thankful the ladies provide the laundry, washer, drying, and refrigerator. Amen. Because we don't have time to do it by hand. Amen. And um, a few, uh, about a, a year and a half ago, my wife came home and found uh, our dryer was on the, the brink of going on fire. 16 years it was health, it was working. And uh, she smelled burning wires and plastic, saved the laundry, but not the dryer. And thankfully, we were able to let the ladies' ministry know. And a week later, we had the money to buy a new dryer. So we're thankful for our ladies' ministry. Amen. But most importantly, the ladies provide a scholarship to the Bible school students uh, from 2004 to 2010. I was the Bible school director. The first day of every year, uh, it was the same thing. Interview each student to find out how much they could pay their school bill. But if you make $2 a day, $200 to go to Bible school is not going to be possible. Um, but I'm thankful I could tell every one of the students, just get good grades and go start a church when you're done here because the ladies' ministry provided you a scholarship. Amen. In Bolivia, we don't just speak Spanish. They speak many dialects. Uh, my wife and daughter are coming in a second. I won't tell you how many. Uh, but it would be impossible to learn all of the dialects spoken there and then go preach in those dialects. So we're thankful we can train those that do speak the dialects and they can go in and start churches. And that's why ladies' ministry is so important because we can train people that already speak those dialects. So I'm going to have my wife and daughter come. And then they're going to do a little puppet show and uh, teach you some words in, in the dialects and tell you a little bit more about Bolivia. Good morning. God bless you. Dios le bendiga. It's a privilege to be here in Ravenswood again. And now we have Pamela with us, and she can teach also. And uh, God is good with us. We are in Bolivia. There's 36 dialects and two main ones that are Quechua and Aymara. And as you know, the word in Spanish for God bless you, Dios le bendiga. But today, Pamela, she's going to teach you those words in Quechua and Aymara. Hola, yo soy Juanita y yo soy Juanito. Venimos desde Bolivia, nuestro continente, para enseñar unas palabras. Yo en Quechua y yo en Aymara. En Quechua se dice... Dios bendice sucho y en Aymara se dice Dios ampique. Espero que les haya gustado y saludos a las guaguitas. And she's saying hello, we're coming from Bolivia. And in eh, Quechua it's Dios bendice sucho and in Aymara it's Dios ampique. We always say that if you come and tell us the words that we taught you, then we're going to give you a coin from Bolivia. And Wawa, like she said, uh, um, I'm here to to teach to the Wawas too, that's children in Quechua, it's Wawa. And sometimes we are concerned about our world, and our world is our families, our neighborhood, our city, our country. But today I'm, I ask you to see the whole world, to be concerned about the whole world, and to have a burden for the whole world. Like the song that says he has the whole world in his hands. And there's three ways that you could go as missionaries, by going, by giving, and by praying. And today I ask if you could be a prayer missionary and go with us as prayer missionaries to the continent of South America, in the heart of South America, and pray for Bolivia and pray for us and the other missionaries, the Marses. We ask you to please keep us in your prayers, and in that way you could come as missionaries with us too. We have uh, several requests for the prison ministry, for the political unrest, and uh, also that uh, God protects us. There's already been three waves of COVID. Now they're going through the fourth one. And um, it was very hard in the third wave. We were not there, but uh, we lost some people from our church and some pastors. But we know that God is faithful and, and he will help us to continue in his work. So please pray for us and also for the access challenge countries. There's countries that cannot, as we do, go to the prisons or, or preach the word freely like we do and in the streets or give them Bibles. So, but please pray. We have a book in our table about those countries. And if you could please help us pray for those countries that are access challenge. As my husband said, we work 
uh, extensively in the prison ministry with the children that live with their parents there. It used to be that there was even young people there, teenagers living there, but now it's under six years old. And in the men's prisons, there's no children, thank God, anymore. But um, we started uh, helping in a place that they would go to eat and to have help in their school during the day. And later, we would we start bringing them to our church and teaching them Sunday school, feeding them lunch, taking them to the park. But during the week, if they needed to go to the doctor, we were able to do that, to take them to the doctor, to be with the ones who that had surgeries and didn't have anyone to be with them. And some of the older ones to be with them in graduation when they didn't have their parents to be with them in their graduation day. So please keep this ministry in your prayers and, and thank you for giving to missions and for your burden. God bless. Amen. We're going to take you on a, about a five minute video. We're going to start flying over the Christ of the Concordia that's over Cochabamba City. We live in Cochabamba City. It's the land of eternal spring. Uh, 8,300 feet above sea level, and uh, I met Brother Jonathan, and immediately started telling me statistics and things about Bolivia. Most people don't know where Bolivia is, and he knows the capital cities, both of them, and uh, that's because of the high altitude in La Paz, which is 13,000 feet above sea level. So when you land in La Paz, it feels like someone hit you in the head and punched you in the stomach at the same time, but uh, we'll save you that by doing it by video today, and then we're going to fly into over to our church that we started in 2012 and then show you the different things that uh, has taken place there. So uh, let's go to Bolivia. The technology is with us.
to a pastor a few weeks ago, we, we do so many ministries, knowing that one of them is going to work, <laughs> but uh, we've learned that if you love people and preach the gospel, amen, doesn't really matter how you do it, it's going to bring forth fruit, amen, the word of God is not bound, the word of God will never come back void, it will fulfill his purpose, amen, how many are thankful this morning that someone shared the gospel with you, yeah. hallelujah. Amen. And Paul said in Romans, we are debtors. Amen. We're debtors to God for saving us, and we're debtors to those that have never met Jesus. We're debtors because we owe them the opportunity to hear the gospel. Amen. Nobody should go to hell without having the opportunity to reject the gospel. Everyone needs to have the opportunity to obey or reject the gospel. Amen. Let it not be said that they went to hell because someone didn't tell them. Amen. I'm thankful. Amen. Someone shared with me the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. Again, it's a privilege to be here. I know it's late. Amen. I want to share with you, amen, briefly from Psalms 139. Amen. We can't do much briefly in Psalms, amen, but we're going to, uh, we're actually going to focus on Esther. But I can't use a verse in Esther because God is not mentioned in Esther. Esther is the only book of the Bible where God is not mentioned or even alluded to. Song of Solomon, allegorically, or in a, in a allegorical f uh, form, I'm trying to speak Spanish here, uh, God is alluded to, but in Esther, God isn't there or doesn't appear to be there. So we're going to start in Psalms 139.7. And David is asking some questions. Where or whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy head lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as a day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Thank you, Jesus, for your word, your people, and your presence. We ask you, Jesus, to help us this morning, this afternoon, to receive a message from your heart to ours that we'd be able to be transformed and renewed by the renewing of our mind and also that our faith would become unshakable, that nothing would move us that we've been established in through your word and through your people. In Jesus' name, everyone said Amen. And I want to share with you, you may be seated, I want to share with you from the thought, the way maker who didn't make an appearance. The way maker who didn't make an appearance. He made a way, but he didn't show up. He prepared, even though no one even knew what he was doing. The way was made without his appearance, without anyone even knowing he was on the scene. In Esther, we know the story. We know the story of how King uh, Ahasuerus called and brought all the young ladies, some say from the age of 15 and older, to come before him to, so he could pick out the new queen. And then how Queen Esther was chosen, a young orphan, the cousin of Mordecai. She went through the process 
and she just shows up as a queen and the savior of the Israelites, the Jews, all over the world. But if you were part of the scene and not looking at hindsight, looking back, we see, wow, that's a beautiful story. But how do you think Mordecai and Esther and the rest of the Jews were feeling in the middle of the unknown? In the middle of darkness and absence, in the middle of, how do you say, amenazas, danger, and, and all of the stuff that was before them, a sure death, because any law written with a signature under the Medes and the Persians had to be fulfilled. There was no loopholes. There was no precedence. There was no way of even going back and eliminating the law. The law had to be fulfilled. And where is God in the middle of all of this? In Psalms 139, David asked the questions, where can I go that you aren't? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you will be there. I take the wings of morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. I will find you there. You dwell in darkness, if that's possible, because he's light, just like you do in the light. Where can I go that you aren't there? But for Esther and Mordecai and the rest of the Jews, he wasn't there. He never showed up. He was absent and silent. And what do you do? In that situation. 2020 was a time that no one will ever forget. January 5th, 2020. It was not only my birthday, but it was our first Sunday church service in 2020. Like many pastors, I got up and showed the church the vision for 2020. I had great plans, Pastor Johnston. I had beautiful plans. I even made a PowerPoint with graphics. My wife's a graphic art designer, so I don't do anything graphic in front of her. She was teaching Sunday school. But I had great plans for 2020. We had several leaders and even a couple young men in our church with local license, and we were going to start a church in five different cities. One of them, six pastors, had gone to start a church and had not been able to. It is a place where it's already started in, in that city. The middle of August, it will fill up. Usually has about 100,000 people there, but it'll, it'll swell to probably a half a million people who come and they'll go at 5 o'clock in the morning, they'll walk 16 miles and then crawl on their knees to go up a mountain to find a rock that was painted to look like the Virgin of Urcupina and worship her and then take a rock from the mountain and go back home, and for the next year, that rock will supposedly bring them blessing, good luck, and great finances. A few months before this event, they have to tr uh, take truckloads of rocks and dump them up on the mountain. There's no rocks on the mountain. And there's a lot of people who no longer believe in it. Are you thankful this afternoon that you cannot do anything to make God love you more? God loves you, exclamation point. It doesn't say semicolon, as long as you don't ever do this, he will love you. If you never do this or you never uh, say or go or do such and such, he'll stop loving you. You cannot do anything for God to love you more, just like you can never do anything for him to love you less. God is not a deadbeat father who abandons his children but it would appear to be so in Esther where he does not speak. There's no prophets. There's no angels. There's silence, darkness, and the threat of the inevitable cruel death to each Jew that is found out. There are many atheists in the world today Many of them are atheists for one or two reasons. One of them is because of 
hypocrites. If that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. There's another group of, of atheists, and I met one when I was working in Bible school. He was 10 years old, and his mother was dying of cancer. He prayed that God would heal his mother, but his mother died, so he became an atheist. About 10 years ago, we were praying for our pastor's wife, great men and, and women, pastors. That they used to pastor the church in Louisiana where we pastored their Spanish church, and it's hard to find people like them. Sister James passed away a few months before their 72nd wedding anniversary. 71 years of happily and faithfully being married. That's hard to find. We knew when we said goodbye in 2010, we'd probably never see them again on this earth. When we heard the news she was sick, we were praying, God, heal her. And then one day I saw her daughter put on Facebook, Mom's praying that God will take her. She wants to go see her baby that died when the baby was two years old. She only talked about going to a place of rest and dying to be pain-free again and to see and hold her baby. And then I realized how hard it is to be God when one person's telling you, you got to heal her. And, and that person that's sick saying, God, just take me. So whether God heals somebody or not is not a sign of his existence. Because how does God answer the prayer of the one saying, God, I want to I rest. I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm sick. And then he hears someone, if you don't heal her, then you don't exist. My wife teaches to the children, God has four different answers when we pray. Do you have time for a Sunday school lesson? God's first answer is yes, and we all want to hear yes. His second answer we never want to hear is no. His third answer is wait. How many here have children? Would you hand a loaded pistol to a 10-year-old boy? No. You tell him, wait. Take your NRA, your concealed carry weapon class and all of this, and wait a few years. Would you give him the keys of your car? Definitely not. Are you a bad parent because you told your child no or wait? Never. The fourth answer to God's, to our prayer request that God gives us is better than the first. How many believe that? Could there be an answer better than yes? He says yes, no, wait, and then he says I got something better than what you're asking for. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I own the whole world. I own every bit of gold, silver, bronze, everything that exists in the world. I own it, and I can give you whatever you ask me that's in my will. So when you understand God's four answers, yes, we know he answered. No, it just means, well, God doesn't hear me or he doesn't exist. But God said no by his silence. Which, number one, is hard to remember, and two, is hard to accept. But when we understand that silence and darkness is not a sign of God abandoning us, and that's when your confidence is growing. I'll never forget the time when our Bible school director and the pastor of one of our Fastest growing church in, in Cochabamba City. I was the district superintendent. I don't know why they, they had me there. 31 years old, didn't know anything. And faced with a situation where his wife died in childbirth, leaving him alone to raise two little boys. The only thing I could tell him was, I'm praying for you that your faith does not fail. That your faith is in Jesus Christ alone. I don't have the answers. I don't have the cliches. And some of the cliche answers do more harm than good. Somebody told me, I asked a question. I, had, I go, I'm going to preach the funeral of a, a pastor's daughter who was run over by a beer truck. She was two years old. What can you say that makes the pain go away? Nothing. Can't even say anything that will make the pain lessen. 
And somebody told me, well, just tell them God needs another angel in his choir, another flower in his garden. Can I be blunt? I said, that's the most stupid thing you could say to a parent. You're telling them God is selfish. God is mean. And he stole your baby to make his flower garden more beautiful because we're not flowers in God's garden. We're not even going to be angels in his choir. I'm here to tell somebody, I don't know who, but I'm here to tell somebody in the darkness and in the crisis and in the storms of life, in the silence, God is still making a way. He is still making a way. I told our church in January 2020, we're going to start churches in five different cities, at least uh, a daughter work or preaching point or at least a cell group. We're going to start five. I had the names of the leaders who I was going to put over each one. On March 15th, COVID hit, and they said, you can't leave your house until we tell you. We couldn't leave our house from March until June except for one day a week for five hours and on foot. Go to the grocery store, the banks, and back home. They checked our ID cards, and if we weren't supposed to be out that one afternoon, they would send us home, sometimes with a fine. So from March until October, we couldn't even have church. March through October, it was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, stay at home. I'm going to build five churches. All the plans in the trash can. Learning how to preach from our office on the video on Facebook. Unbeknownst to us, a man came into Bolivia. He was born and raised in the city we were going to start the church in. As a young person, he moved to Argentina to make a better life. Got into church Became a pastor. He came to Bolivia in, Mar in early March to visit his dad who was sick. Before he got to the border of Bolivia, he got a phone call. His dad had passed away. If he knew what everyone knew later, he would have gone right home to his wife and family in, in church. But he decided to visit his family and go to the funeral. And then they shut the borders. From March until December, he could not leave Bolivia. But when he could leave his house, he would go visit friends and family. And he visited a, a family, uh, a friend that he had uh, as a childhood. We had him on the video walking into the church. He was the man that walked into church right before we did. We went to visit him. Long story short, the man invited him to his church. His church was the Assembly of God Church in that city, a church of 300 people. The pastor had died of COVID. Unfortunately, he left his elderly wife in charge, and she invited our pastor to preach. And started preaching, teaching, establishing them in the doctrine. Long story short, in December when he called to say goodbye, he said, Pastor, can you come and pastor these people so I can go home, resign my church, and come back to Bolivia with my family. On February 14th, we baptized nine of the adults in Jesus' name. They all had the Holy Ghost, but they got revelation of Jesus' name baptism. And yesterday, the Amer told me that the, the pastor can't bring his whole family yet because of the restrictions, but he's going to sneak in by bus and baptize another group, another half of the group. There's 45 to 50 of them meeting every Sunday. The man that walked in to our church on the video owns a garage that holds 30 cars in his customer area waiting room. Uh, we can have 50 to 60 chairs set up and have church in a rent-free building. We pay zero rent, have 50 members already there, nine of them baptized in Jesus' name, about 20 of them filled with the Holy Ghost. Even when I can't see him, he's working. Even when it looks like he's not doing anything, he's working. Church was shut down from March until October, but 16 pastors told us, we added up the total, 122 people were baptized during churchless Meetings. I had to ride a bike for 45 minutes to baptize one young man in his dad's swimming pool. One of my Bible school students rode a bike for three hours to baptize seven or eight people in Jesus' name in his swimming pool. Amen. It was just 
getting out of the box and just doing and going. Because whatever's surrounding us is nothing to be compared about the miracle that's about ready to get into us. And when I cannot see him, I know he's working. Because I don't have time to do it, but if you go into Esther chapter 2, verse 9. I'm sorry I forgot to give it to the, the people in the back. But Esther chapter 2, Haggai, the keeper of the woman, noticed something special about Esther. It wasn't just because she was born with good looks. God gave her favor that opened doors with Hagar. And Hagar said, whatever you need or even want, I'm going to get it to you. And then jump down to verse 17. The king loved Esther above all the women. Now there's 127 provinces there. There's probably hundreds of thousands in what would be today a beauty pageant. And God put favor on Esther. She obtained grace and favor in the king's sight more than all the other young ladies. He's not there. He's silent. There doesn't look like there's a way out. We're on our way to get our heads chopped off by a sword. Where is God in this situation? Where is the way maker? He didn't make an appearance, but he was still making it a way. If I go up to heaven or go down to hell or to the depths of the sea, he's going to be there. Even if I don't know it, even if I don't understand it, he's going to be there. So what do I do in the midst of all of this? What do we do in darkness, in silence? What do we do in the moment we think that God doesn't even exist? In Ezekiel chapter 36, there's about seven or eight verses there where God says, I will. For example, 23, I will sanctify my great name. 25, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Verse 27, I'll put my spirit within you. 29, I will also save you from all your uncleanness. Verse 30, I will multiply the fruit of the tree. But verse 36 shows us, or 37 shows us the clause. Verse 36, powerful. Then the heathen that are left around about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places, plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. But there's two things that have to take place before God will do something. Verse 37, give us the clue for the first one. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. A little hard to understand in this old King James English. But God is basically saying, if you'll ask me, then I will do it. All you have to do is ask. And then in Zechariah chapter 14, 17. We'll go to 16 first. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go, even go up from the year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Every year you got to go up to Jerusalem. Why? Verse 17. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king of the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. We sing the song, send down the rain, Lord. Send down the rain. I have had to learn to read very closely contracts and different things. I was, for three or four years, I was the legal representative of Bolivia and had to look through, uh, and in Spanish it's not very easy, uh, but look through all the contracts and the legal stuff and try to find everything to make sure we weren't signing something that was going to cause us greater pain and, and cost later. So I always look for things when I'm reading something. Okay, get to the fine print. And I want to see what the, the conclusion of the matter will be. And when you look at this verse, God is basically saying, you want it to rain, you got to go to Jerusalem and worship first. I need you to do something. And that is what Esther did. She said, call everyone for three days of fasting and prayer. We'll fast and pray. We'll put our faces in the floor. I love to look at patterns. As a Bible quizzer, I learned that 
uh, it was important to study patterns and verses in Scripture. And one of the things I see constantly, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are patterns. You see where they brought to Jesus the blind men six different times, if I'm not mistaken, they brought a blind man to Jesus. The first time Jesus just touched him, put his hand on the shoulder, and he was healed of blindness. So the second time, they, they bring a, a blind man to Jesus, and they tell him, put your hand on him, and he'll be healed. But Jesus didn't say, oh, yeah, that's from class 101, how to do a miracle in Bible school. Jesus violated tradition and protocol. He violated doctor-patient hygiene, social distance, and out the window. He spit in the man's face. What was Jesus doing? He was saying, I am not, and I will never be predictable. Because there, there's not a five-step way of doing it. It's not instant either. The verse in, in Isaiah where it says, the, the anointing shall break the yoke. I was reading that in Spanish. It says, la unción pudrirá el yugo. The, the anointing will rot the yoke. It takes a lot more longer than... than just breaking the yoke to rot out a yoke. I talked to someone uh, smarter than me that knows about yokes. I asked him a question. Is it possible for that oxen to make a yoke just rot after years of sweating? And I'm not sure if it's possible. But sometimes we want an instant miracle. The anointing will rot the yoke. It takes a little bit longer. It's not instantaneous. And that is why Jesus didn't do the same step, five-step way of doing it, because he's showing us something there. He's saying it's not a five-step way of seeking your miracle. It's putting your nose in the floor and seeking my will in my direction. Because we're talking about a God that creates a snowflake different every time he does it. And as I close this morning, this afternoon... If he will take his time to create a different snowflake every time he does it, how many different ways can God take care of your situation right now? He has a million different ways of healing you, of providing for you, of taking care of your situation. So it may not be the same way. There's only one time where the shadow of Peter is mentioned healing the sick. God can do it that way or can repeat something but in the supernatural we don't have precedence all the time as you stand right now man I want to convince somebody here this afternoon you may seem that God has abandoned you that God has ignored your prayer requests God do you know how many days I've fasted about this do you know how many prayer chains we've put this on Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he had a second funeral. God may not heal our loved ones. Yesterday was a very bad day for us. Wake up and find out at 3 o'clock in the morning, a friend and pastor, the president or superintendent of our church in Guatemala. When I went to Guatemala in 93, he was 18 years old. We were on the youth committees, going to all the camp meetings, traveling together. One of the greatest and sharpest leaders you could ever meet. And if you're not careful, you ignore him because he doesn't look like some of the leaders that are notable. To find out he died of COVID. God didn't answer all of our prayer requests, but he's still God. He's still on the throne because our faith doesn't stand in the wisdom of men. Our faith doesn't stand in philosophies. An experience will trump a philosophy every day of the week. And I have enough experience with Jesus to know I don't always understand and I don't always agree with what he does. But he's never wrong. I hate to do this as you're standing, but in Genesis, 
listen to a pastor the other day doing a Zoom conference and he used this verse and I'm going to plagiarize it for the rest of my life. It says, the, the one who judges the earth is fair. Genesis 18, 25. Abraham is bargaining with Jehovah, with God, about how many righteous he needs to find in Sodom and Gomorrah to, to, to not bring judgment there. Far be from me to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee. And then Abraham asked this question, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Is he God? Then he will always do right. Life is never fair. Life is getting more bitter and even harder. Three times I deleted posts on Facebook yesterday because in my situation as a leader, I cannot be human sometimes and express my bitterness and even anger. Pastor that died May 10th of this year. Brother Johnson, I thought when I leave Bolivia as an old man, this young man was my first Bible school student. He'll be the pastor of the church that we pastor right now. He was my district secretary. I handed him my monthly reports. He now was my authority, even though he used to be my Bible school student. And to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning hearing my wife react to the text that he passed away, leaving a five-year-old boy named after me. I don't say that to brag. I say that to so that there is a relationship there, a closeness. When his dad passed away, I became a father figure to him. I didn't have the filter in my mouth, and I said, I have a list of people that should die before him. I had to repent. But God is still God, even when he's silent, even when you think he's not there. He's the way maker that never showed up because he made a way for Haggai to take a liking to Esther out of all the thousands of ladies present that day. He made it so that King Ahasuerus would pick her to be the queen. But what did Esther have to do? She had to spend six months bathing in mirror, the spices that, that are used during death to embalm. Six months of figurative repentance of dying to the flesh so that she could present herself to the king without smelling. And that is what we need to do when we go into the presence of God through our worship is to repent. Right now, is there someone here that just wants to raise their hands and say, Jesus, I just want to repent of everything I've done, said, or even thought. Jesus, I want to draw your attention. And I want to do that through dying to flesh and worshiping. Even when I don't hear him, even when I don't feel him, even when I don't feel like worshiping, even when I'm feeling like I'm in depression and I just want to say, where is God right now? Where is God when I'm hurting? Where is God when I'm sad and suffering? Where is God in the pain? Where is God every time I go up and get anointed? Every service. But yet I will trust him. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. He's never given up on me. Is there someone here that wants to come up front and say, I need special prayer right now? I believe, but help my unbelief. Jesus told the man, I can heal your son if you can believe. He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. He wasn't an agnostic or an atheist. He was just saying, my emotions are on the floor right now. I've gone to every doctor. I've gone to every preacher. I've gone to your disciples, and no one has been able to heal my son. I want to believe, but I'm tired. I'm tired. My emotions are tired. My spirit is worn out. I've tried. I've prayed. I've fasted. I've gone through every prayer line. I've gone to every prayer chain. 
But will you try trusting him one more time? Even when you cannot feel him, he's working. Even when you cannot see him, he's working. Even though he never made an appearance, he was making a way. Hallelujah.